thank you guys. Um, I want to thank Pep and CXL for having me here. And uh, thank you. I'm going to need all of your guys' encouragement as I head into the weekend. But I have to say that I've been much more terrified about getting up here than I have been about going to national championships. Um, but uh, before I get into the full presentation, I just want to everyone get your phone out right now. This is the one and only picture, the one and only that you need. Can you get the slides? Yes, you can at this URL. I know they're sending them out after the conference, but if you just can't wait, this is where you can get them even sooner. But make sure you still fill out the survey that they send out. Super important. All right. Now, if you Google how to use psychology to improve your conversion rates, you will find no shortage of flashy headlines and web psychology experts that are going to tell you how you can use these principles to produce higher converting campaigns, websites, and apps. Even I am guilty of writing one of these posts. But about a year ago, something about all of this advice really started to bother me. And that's because people's behavior, just understanding it, is a lot more complicated. And trying to actually influence behavior is incredibly more complicated than all of these posts make it out to be. And this is the point at which I should give you some kind of reason why you should listen to my guidance on this subject. See, I wasn't always in this industry. In fact, about three years ago, I didn't know the difference between SEO, CRO, JavaScript, HTML. No idea. Now, I was actually a social psychology researcher. Yes, I'm the idiot who was spent th six years racking up loans uh, to get my PhD while you were all out there making money. Uh, but anyways, for those that are not familiar, social psychology is a study of how our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are influenced by others. And it's really where a lot of these principles that are um, talked about by marketers, advertising, conversion rate optimization, uh, where they come from, this division of psychology. And this is why my conscience was nagging me, because I should know better. I know just how difficult and complicated it is to influence people's behavior. And so it is time to stop selling persuasive technology as a magic formula. And so I'm here to right my wrongs by helping you all avoid the pitfalls of the unaware, so that you don't unknowingly damage your conversion rates, your marketing effectiveness, and your brand. And I'm going to do that by first telling you all basically what I believe to be the root of this problem. And that is how psychological research makes it from the academic lab to all of you. Then I'm going to lay out these four pitfalls. And let you know what happens when these principles are applied or misapplied by people that are unaware. And then I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to close out with what you can do to avoid these pitfalls so that you can try and successfully apply some of these psychological principles to your work. All right, so to start off, how does psychological research, really any scientific research, make its way to the public? Well, it starts with the researcher, who's under a lot of pressure to produce work that gets attention from academic journals and the media, because this is how they keep their jobs and how their research gets funded. They then submit this research to academic journals or scientific journals, who are essentially the gatekeeper between the researcher and everybody else. But see, the problem is that scientific journals have a in, at least in social psychology, have a 70% rejection rate, which means that you are seeing very little of the research that's being conducted. Now, if you make it past this gatekeeper, your article is then picked up by media agents for research institutions who have become very good and adept at turning complicated scientific jargon into compelling press releases, often at the expense of accuracy. These press releases are then picked up by journalists who further stretch, exaggerate, and torture the original paper until its meaning is almost nearly lost. 
Then bloggers pick up these articles and they further simplify and sexify the findings. And finally, it makes its way to you. Maybe you see it in a Twitter post. And now a 20-page research article has become 160 characters. Now what we have here, folks, is a game of telephone. And for anyone who's played the game of telephone, we all know what happens to the person at the end, right? Who suffers in this game of telephone? Well, it's you, the unaware practitioner, who attempts to apply these techniques, and they either end up not producing any effect at all, or worse, triggering the exact opposite effect. So what are these four pitfalls? I'm gonna get into them, but as I do, I want you to keep in mind the characters from our game of telephone and the role that they play in each pitfall. Okay, pitfall number one. So the result of all this cropping and chopping that journalists and bloggers and media agents do is oversimplification of scientific research. Now the unavoidable dilemma is just that, you know, media outlets, they need to be concise and catchy. So unfortunately, <laughs> qualifiers and nuance are bound to be omitted. Even when journalists include these caveats, they often lose force when combined with these kind of flashy clickbait titles. It's also a problem that most often the writer of an article is not the one who even comes up with the title. This is often left up to the whims of an editor who, let's be honest, is more concerned with attracting readers than being accurate. I mean, which would you rather read? Competing to be certain but wrong, market dynamics and excessive confidence and judgment, or humans prefer cockiness to expertise. I mean, there's really no competition. So let's say, and let's see how this process of oversimplification plays out. So say you come across this headline, how to persuade people online 17 lesser known Jedi mind tricks. I just love that title, so sexy. Yes, I'm going to pick on Pep a little bit here. And I am fully aware that this is a case of the pot calling the kettle black. So Pep, please forgive me. It's all for learning. So you click through and you see trick number seven, frame it in the positive. Emphasizing the positive can be more persuasive than pointing out the negative. Now I'm gonna give Pep a lot of credit here because he uses a lot of qualifying language. When he talks about this, he says that there was a slight persuasive advantage to the messages that were framed positively. He also tells you to try it and see if it makes a difference for you, meaning no promises, try it out for yourself. The problem is, again, that a lot of these qualifiers and nuance just get glossed over, but not by you folks, not anymore. You are gonna be smarter than that. You're gonna pay attention to those qualifiers. But even so, is that what was actually found in the study? Well, why don't we look at it? So in the original study by O'Keefe and his colleague Jensen, what they actually state is that a meta-analytic review based on 42 effect sizes with an N equals to 6,378 finds that game frame messages engender slightly but significantly greater message engagement than do loss frame messages. What the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> it's confusing, it's jargony. Right? And so that is how we end up going from an explanation like that to something like this. Emphasizing the positive can be more persuasive than pointing out the negative. That I can understand. You can understand. We can all understand. But even so, is that exactly what was found? See, I see that this says more persuasive, but up above, it's talking about greater message engagement. So does greater engagement mean more persuasive? Well, I don't know. Let's see what they meant. So they assessed engagement using four measures. Message-related thoughts, memory for the message, other assessments, and multiple assessments, whatever that means. What I don't see here is any mention of persuasiveness or the effectiveness of these messages to persuade people. So the original claim we actually start, started with is not even what was found, at least not in this study. But it gets worse. As a trained eye continues on and reads, we actually find that this effect was only found for be messages advocating disease prevention, not for consumer advertising messages. But the media is focused on simple effects. So by the time it makes it to you, 
these moderators magically disappear. Now, the next thing that happens in this oversimplification is that correlation is confused with causation. Now, high quality social science reporting makes it very clear when causal claims are warranted, when there's random assignment and strict experimental control. We kind of talked about that earlier. However, a study by Sumner and their colleagues in 2016 found that 38% of news stories reported a stronger causal wording than was warranted by the original journal article. And this rose to over 80% when the original press release had first made um, this claim. So once again, we see our game of telephone at work. So what does this mean for you? If it too, looks too simple, it probably is. It is very rare in the study of human behavior to find single cause, single effect behaviors. We got, we got some action in the back. <laughs> and then just because a reputable blogger or reporter said it, it doesn't mean it's accurate. You're still responsible to do your fact checking. And ignoring caveats and qualifiers can actually backfire on you. So pay attention to these. Pitfall number two, overestimating the size of effects. Why does this happen? Well, in academic research, scientists live and die by statistical significance. Maybe you can relate. But why is this for them? Well, publish or perish is tattooed on the mind of every academic, because your ability to get and keep an academic job depends on your ability to be published. Now, remember those gatekeepers that I talked about? Well, the thing is that your work will only get published if you produce in most cases, a statistically significant effect. All this means is that the result, is usually a difference, is large enough to have been unlikely to have occurred due to chance or sampling error. Now, this causes two issues. One is that we rarely, if ever, hear about research that doesn't find an effect. And this is known as a file drawer issue. I'm not gonna go into it today, just Google it, read up on it. The other, well, you'll notice here. So if, you're, if your results fall into these two regions, congratulations, your work's publishable, right? But if it falls in this region, you just wasted the last year of your academic life. But the other thing is that statistical significance does not equal practical significance. Statistical significance just tells you whether effect exists right? Practical significance refers to the magnitude of this effect and whether it is meaningful. In fact, statistical significance is highly influenced by sample size. So with a large enough sample size, even the very smallest of effects can be determined statistically significant. But no statistical test can tell you whether this effect will be meaningful in your situation, specifically in the real world. Now the other thing is that the media severely simplifies results, both in terms of whether an effect exists, as we saw, but also in how strong that effect is, because this just makes for a better and sexier story. So I'm gonna show you how this plays out with a principle that you may have all come across, the scarcity principle, which suggests that if we manipulate the scarcity of our product, offer, or service, that we can increase its value. Now, marketers attempt to capitalize the, on this by doing things like advertising a product scarcity, releasing something for a limited amount of time, or restricting the maximum order size. You can see Southwest hit me up with this when I was trying to get a flight home from Salt Lake City this weekend when they told me that there was just one seat left. And why wouldn't you try this tactic? It seems to work for every other CRO blogger out there. But just how strong is this effect on us? Well, lucky for us, Michael Lynn answered that question back in 1991 when he conducted a meta-analysis on this effect. Now what he found was a mean effect size of R equal to 0.12. Now just to give you some context, an R equal to 0.2 conventionally is considered small. And this is even smaller than that. And this is found under 
highly controlled, i.e. perfect conditions, not the real world. So what does this mean for you? Just because a bunch of studies have produced a statistically significant effect of a persuasion or psychological technique does not mean that this is gonna have any sort of real effect when you try to apply it. That small difference they detected may be meaningless in your situation. Now, if it takes very little resources to try and apply this effect, you know, no harm, no hope, foul. But if you are investing significant resources, you may want to do a little more digging into what effect you, or the size of that effect you can actually achieve in a practical sense. And then, of course, as you'll be probably be told over and over, test it on a small scale first. All right, this moves on to pitfall number three, overgeneralizing. By this, I mean drawing conclusion that is more general than is justified by the available evidence. So the biggest thing that non-technical audiences, whether it's the public or journalists, get wrong is the limits of any single study. See, every study comes with boundaries, incompleteness, and uncertainty. And these nuances are often really hard for researchers to communicate, even harder for journalists to write about. But essentially, these boundary conditions are the conditions under which a theory or research finding is held true or not. It's also a way for researchers to cover their asses when someone else doesn't find the effect under slightly different circumstances. But, you know, I should have told all the academics to leave the room before, before I got in on this. Sorry, Brian. Okay. The other thing that happens is that People disregard limitations. There are a lot of limitations to the studies in which these principles are based. In fact, at the end of most any one of these studies, you will find this sentence. Further research is necessary to see if this pattern of results can be replicated, and then it'll be followed by in a real world context, with a more diverse sample, or in a longitudinal study. And see, the reason for these qualifiers is that your typical social psychology experiment takes place with undergraduate participants, mostly white, middle to upper class, in controlled laboratory setting. They involve academic-like tests and hypothetical situations. They rely on self-reported data collected via questionnaire. And they are very rarely, if ever, longitudinal in nature, often taking place within a few hours. So I'll give you an example of how this plays out. Like the scarcity principle, you've probably heard of this one foot in the door technique. It assumes that if I ask a small request and you agree to that small request up front, say in the classic experiments it was to sign a petition, then you're more likely to agree to a second larger request. For example, putting a campaign yard sign um, in your yard. Now, from the original study, the authors, the authors back in that you know, limitation section, they point out that this set of studies took place in a very special type of situation. Specifically, these were requests being made by presumably non-service, uh, non-profit service organizations. The issues in the study were deliberately non-controversial, such that almost all subjects initially sympathized with the objectives. This is obviously in massive contrast to campaigns that are designed to sell a certain product, a political candidate, or a dogma, as they say. So whether the technique employed in these studies will hold true in other situations remains to be shown. So maybe you're thinking, yeah, but that was like over 50 years ago. Surely someone has addressed these limitations by now. Well, in another meta-analysis conducted in 2013 by Pasquale and his colleagues, they state that most of the studies using the paradigm tested pro-social requests. So the generalizations of this technique to other types of requests remains an open question. So I'm sorry to tell you, no, they haven't. So what does all of this mean for you? You may not be able to reproduce the same effects seen in these studies if your target market is not college-educated, upper to middle class, white 18 to 19 year olds. And if your marketing or your website or whatever it is takes place in the real world, duh, under conditions that you have little to no control over, double duh. But this next one I think is the scariest one. 
and that we should really pay attention to. We are almost completely blind to the long-term effects of these persuasive techniques. I'm gonna let that sink in. These experiments take place within a few hours. Rarely, if ever, even followed up a single time afterwards, let alone a month, a year down the line. That gets us to pitfall number four. One very common mistake in the media is to treat a single published finding as definitive. And it's an easy trap to fall into. I see academics do it as well. Um, but no single study can say very much on its own. It may be that that study builds on a lot of previous research and a well-tested theory, or it could be that it's just a one-off or fluke. But by the time it makes it to you and has gone through this uh, game of telephone, it's totally ripped from its context, and you have no idea which one you're getting. So just to let you in on this, the, the aim of initial psychological research is to isolate the effect of a variable or a set of variables on an outcome variable. But these relationships do not exist in isolation once they leave the lab. And researchers know this, so they use follow-up research to see the ways in which principles or theories interact with each other. They also introduce additional variables into the picture, known as mediators and moderators, to see how they actually change the relationship between these variables. But again, by the time it makes its way through the media and to you, it's often ripped from its context, and this information is completely lost. Let's see how this plays out with another one you guys may all be familiar with, the loss aversion phenomenon. So basically, this tells us that a loss of a given size is viewed as more aversive than a gain of the same size is viewed as pleasurable. So if I'm making some kind of financial judgment, I'm gonna be more motivated not to lose $5 I already have than to gain $5 that I don't have. And marketers apply this principle when they attempt to take away your access to resources, a free trial, or spot on their mailing list. This is all to make, emphasize kind of that potential loss of something that you already own. So I came across this article where this blogger talks about this and he recommends using it, this loss framing, when talking about upgrading freemium or free trials. And he gives us several examples of ways we can do this. We can say 10 days until you lose access, 10 days before we block your login details, 10 days before your 50% discount goes away. But there's just one problem. It's not that simple. See, since the original study on loss aversion back in 1980, there have been quite a few mediators and moderators found. For example, self-threat, identity associations of good, gender, emotions of disgust, value of good, nature of transactions, size of outcome, availability of resources, type of relationship norm, motivation to complete the transaction, intentions to exchange versus consume, emotional attachment to good, cognitive focus, and regulatory focus, just to name a few. In fact, it has been found that loss aversion does not happen in routine transactions. It doesn't happen when an outcome is less than about 30 euros or $50. And it does not happen when there is, or when someone has an abundance of expendable resources. But I'm gonna dive into this last one, regulatory focus, so we can see what happens when two theories collide. Now you're familiar with loss aversion, I just talked about it. I wanna introduce you to regulatory focus theory, which tells us that people pursue goals differently when they're motivated by prevention versus promotion. So if I'm in a prevention mode, I wanna avoid negative outcomes. If I'm in a promotion mode, I wanna gain positive outcomes. So let's say my goal is to make it to work on time. If I am in a prevention focus mode, I may be thinking, I don't wanna be late because I don't wanna get fired. I may be trying to get to work on time in a promotion focus mode because I'm thinking, I wanna to prove to my boss that I'm an excellent employee and I wanna get my next raise. The goal is the same, but my motivations are different. Now, in isolation, framing something as a loss has a positive relationship with loss aversion. However, if you accidentally prime someone to be promotion-focused mode, you actually kill the effect of loss aversion. So how could we accidentally prime someone to be in promotion focus? Well, maybe you include a, something like this on your, in your email, your landing page, your website. Want to continue generating quality leads for your business? promotion focused, and then you 
Use our suggestion from our blogger, 10 days until you lose access to your lead generating platform. Tried to invoke loss aversion. No one upgrades. You just killed your effect. I'll show you another example. So everyone in marketing and advertising should be familiar with this one. The use of celebrities for endorsements. Now it's influencers, right? But it has been shown, researchers have found, that pairing a brand with you know, a trusted, attractive, or like celebrity enhances attitudes and behavioral intentions towards that brand. But see, it's not that simple. So what has been found since the original research is that the effectiveness of this actually is very dependent on the degree of fit between the brand and the celebrity. I'm gonna show you this in a real world example. Imagine you are a fast food burger company. You're thinking, you know who I would get to endorse my greasy, cheesy burger? A beautiful, thin celebrity. What we have here, folks, is a mismatch and a couple million dollars wasted. I mean, because when I see this, I'm thinking, does that fit in her diet? What does a celebrity, a rich celebrity, know about fast food? I mean, most importantly, like, what does she know about what good food is at all? <laughs> now, if I'm Carl's Jr., you know who I get to endorse my burger? Guy Fieri. That guy knows good fast food. He's probably a hell of a lot cheaper, too. So what does this mean for you? When applying a psychological principle or technique to try and influence your marketing outcomes, be aware that additional variables in the context, many that you have little to no control over, may negate or reverse the effect of that principle that you're trying to produce. And that employing multiple techniques does not necessarily have an additive effect. They can actually cancel each other out or even produce an opposing effect. So I didn't mean to depress you all. And I don't want you to just think you should never try to apply psychological techniques to your CRO efforts. Because they can be a great starting point in persuading um, people's behavior and influencing behavior. But I want to help you to avoid misapplying these techniques in a way that damages your conversion rates, your marketing effectiveness, or your brand. So what can you do to avoid these pitfalls? In all honesty, the best way to evaluate one of these technique, uh, techniques is to simply find the time to read the original study. When you're looking at the, that original study, look to see what was actually found. What was the size of the effect? How was it conducted? Who were the subjects? Are there any legitimate limitations to the research? Do they mention any caveats? Are there any moderating factors? Then take a step back. Try to understand the study in its context. What is the theory or principle underlying the, the underlying the finding? You can take a look backwards. What research was conducted before this study? Look in the references section. Then look for the research that's been done since. Who has cited this original study? Are there any conflicting studies or alternative explanations out there? And don't get caught up in hacks. You know, unfortunately, scientific research often gets written up with this kind of news you can use angle. So it's like how to improve your life, change your relationships, improve your organization. But it's just really not that simple. So if you find one of these techniques or principles and you want to try to apply it to your marketing, I say test it for yourself. But then be aware of what can go wrong. So with your specific test in mind, think of all the possible ways it could backfire. And then you need to weigh the risks. Are they worth it? We talked a bit earlier about weighing those risks. Then test it in a portion of your audience or site first. Don't just push it live to everything right away, because it's based on science. And then after running your test and determining if it improved um, your conversion rates or not, you need to look for evidence of backfiring. And this is going to involve qualitative research, which we talked about earlier, Els talked about. User testing, surveys. And then 
very importantly, consider the long-term impact. If you did something that successfully influenced or modified behavior in the short term, you need to look and see how is it affecting down the funnel conversions. And then consider, will it translate to other places? Just because it works on one part of your audience, it can actually backfire with another. And this is gonna come down to a cost-benefit analysis judgment on your part. And then rinse and repeat. Don't just test it once and then make sweeping recommendations. Test it a couple times in different contexts. Now, I wanna thank you all for being a part of helping me right my wrongs. If you wanna continue the conversation, I've got about 20 slides worth more of pitfall examples that I'd be happy to talk to you about at happy hour, or here is where you can find me online. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. All right, so we'll just take a couple of questions. Uh, for anyone looking for her slides, they're now available in the app, so you can find them there. But let's just go with uh, the first question here. What's your favorite social science experiment we might not know about? Oh my gosh, there's, so this is like one of those things that drives me crazy, because like, it's like the five, same five studies that are talked about in everything. It's like Milgram, it's like the prison experiment, all of this. Um, I would say that some of my favorite social science experiments have been around um, social identity theory. And a lot of it is um, some stuff around like contact hypothesis, things like that, trying to get rid of things like prejudices and things like that, um, where you actually have laboratory experience where you bring people in to do something together um, that are from very differing backgrounds, and then they're seeing how that actually lessens people's prejudice. Um, but I could talk about a lot of different types of experiments and experimental paradigms if anyone wants to try and hit me up. I don't know that I have one specific favorite, though. Okay, they can hit you up after, during happy hour. And then just our last question is, what types of resources would you recommend marketers use if these studies aren't to be trusted? Now, I, I don't want to say that the studies shouldn't be trusted, because one of the things that these academic journals do do is that they're peer-reviewed, right? So there are people checking to make sure that more or less that, you know, is based on solid um, statistics, solid research methods. It's often what I see is in the translation to the public that a lot of this gets lost. So it's more of when these, they get ripped from their original context. Um, however, you should still look and see what claim people are making and what did they actually do or measure, right? And this doesn't even take any scientific training. Just look at what the actual measures were and then see, does that match the claim? So if they're claiming that it was more persuasive, did they actually measure persuasion? Or are they making a leap or a jump? So that's what, those are some of my tips. Try and read it. I'm not saying do not trust scientific research. I'm saying read the nuance. Look at it a little bit deep, more deeply, and when people report on it, just know that some things are lost. Thank you so much, Tammy. Right, thank you. Thank you.